Well, hello and welcome again. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Today's forum, Restaurants Nourish Revitalization, is sponsored by the Dispatch Media Group, represented here by many of their associates. Will you please help me thank them for their support? Well, the idea of breaking bread or lifting a pint or two with friends and neighbors at the local watering hole probably goes back, well, to the beginning of life. Coffee shops, the corner bar, the local diner, many different types of food and drink establishments are germane to the fabric of any community and certainly, I think, this community. But which comes first, the neighborhood or the eatery? Well, let's explore some of Columbus examples of past situations and see what's on the horizon for the future for our food city. So please welcome food critic, cooking instructor, and retired attorney, Steve Stover. <laughs> food critic, cooking instructor, and also retired, sort of semi-retired attorney, Rich Terrapack. Co-founder and CEO of ColumbusUnderground.com, and I understand several other companies that you and your wife have developed, Walker Evans. And our host for this afternoon's conversation is Erin Edwards, who is Columbus Monthly and digital editor of Dispatch Magazines. She's a dining editor for Columbus Monthly. Erin, let's take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and uh, welcome, everyone, to today's panel discussion. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your, your lunch, since we're talking about food today. So we are discussing uh, how Columbus's restaurant scene is driving our economy. We have three perfect qualified panelists to, to discuss uh, this subject, and it's really kind of a check, chicken and egg scenario. Um, you know, in my job, I'm used to thinking about where to find the best fried chicken, the best eggs benedict. So I just want to clarify, we're not talking about that today. Is that right? Um, okay, now that we've uh, clarified that, uh, let's kick it off by looking back at some examples um, of restaurants that have opened and, and really helped to spur change in a neighborhood. Uh, I think Grandview is probably a great place to start. Uh, Steve or, or Rich, uh, can you talk about the impact uh, that Spaggio had on that area? Absolutely. Uh, Chef Hubert and Helga Seifert opened a little place called the Gourmet Market um, probably 30 years ago in what was then known as the Bank Block. There was a bank on Grandview Avenue. And it really, in that instance, it really did drive a lot of the growth because it was one of the first restaurants on Grandview Avenue. Uh, there was probably Prezzuti's on and uh, Romeo's Pizza on Fifth Avenue around the corner, but that was really a, not a not a great food area. And I think they're the pioneers of that area. And he told me once that there were you know half a dozen restaurants when he came, and there are now 80 or 90 restaurants in the area within pretty much within walking distance of Spaggio. Uh, let's see. Now, Walker, if we move downtown, can you talk a little bit about uh, Gay Street and, you know, which now seems to be really thriving? Uh, so what kind of started that to turn around? Yeah, our, our offices are on uh, Gay Street, so it's an area we, we spend a lot of time on, uh, a lot of time eating lunch there and, and hanging out there after work as well. But uh, sort of the, the modern, I guess, renaissance of Gay Street that I think a lot of people would, you know, kind of think about when talking about the area began probably 10, 15 years ago when some of the restaurants that are there now started to open. Uh, Duomichi was one of the first ones uh, to kind of come into the area, Jeff Mathis' restaurant. Um, Tip Top, a little more casual, one of the Liz Lesnar restaurants. Her brother Tim Lesnar uh, runs that uh, that place right next door. Um, Cafe Brioso, which is a, a coffee roastery. Uh, they also do lunch, uh, a really nice lunch there. But I think I'm there every day. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, they were some of the first in that kind of 10, 10, 12, 15 year ago kind of range. Um, we've seen a lot more kind of come and go. It's a really interesting area um, because you know, 10, 15 years ago, downtown was mostly tumbleweeds. 
Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, apartment growth. Uh, the, the residential um, uh, demographic downtown has grown uh, by leaps and bounds over the past 10 years. So we've started to see people willing to go a little outside of the, the lunch demographic. A lot of restaurants could just thrive, you know, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., do their lunch business, close at night, close on weekends, and kind of create that, that ghost town effect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's with, you know, like you said, it's chicken and egg. With more people comes more uh, nighttime and weekend uh, business, and then the more you have that, the more you have visitors coming downtown as well. So it all kind of goes hand in hand toward uh, boosting the, uh, the economic viability of an area. Right. And uh, it, it was exciting to see Veritas moving uh, to that area, which was probably a big step for them. Um, so I, again, chicken and egg, is downtown ready for, for Veritas? Yeah, I've, I've heard that they're doing really well. I, I haven't uh, been in for dinner yet. I stopped in for lunch once, um, but they seem, they seem to be doing a good job. I don't know if you guys have been in there yet. Yep. Great. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, they're doing a great job. And the, the other thing you have to see when you're when you arrive there is walk up. You can't get there from the front door. You have to go through the restaurant. Uh, walk up to the bar, which is in the old bank lobby. It's it's uh, they've done a spectacular job of uh, making it feel very cosmopolitan. Um, and it's it's a, it's it's a great bar. Mm -hmm. And lest we forget, the keep in the new Levesque Hotel is also part of downtown. I'm not sure. If when, when you're talking about downtown, it really is a chicken and egg because I, it seems like the restaurants are following the lodging there, whereas uh, in other places it, it might be, for example, I hope we'll talk about North Forth as an emerging area, that Italian village, that it seems like the restaurants may be flipping it around. Mm -hmm. Well, talk a little bit about North Forth. You want me to take North He's Forth? The uh, <laughs> the, the, um, actually, we call the neighborhood uh, North of Broad. Um, but it could be north of Maine because uh, essentially, it, starting with uh, you know the, the, the old time places were like the little palace, which had to go go under to be reborn in a in a, in a new uh, and and wonderful way. Uh, but it, then we've got around the corner on Main Street, Walrus, which has has a great. Uh, Two for fourteen dollar lobster roll with fries, <laughs> with lots of fries. <laughs> but you've got Mickey's uh, late night uh, open there. Hadley's is there. Velvet is there. Um, who am I forgetting? Dirty Frank's. Dirty Frank. Yeah, Dirty Frank's probably uh, <clears throat> was in their second, and it's it's really uh, it's really wonderful. It, it, they they think I think feed off of the student population, and it makes a lot of sense. You've got. Uh, CCAD, uh, you've got Franklin and others in that neighborhood, and you can get a hot dog for three bucks. Um, the, uh, if you keep going north uh, on fourth, uh, you, you got a couple other new ones. Mona's just opened a shop. That, was, that woman was a senior vice president of a bank and didn't like foreign travel anymore, so she's opened a mom and pop's place. Uh, there's a, a, a South American restaurant right next to, to that. Then keep going north, uh, and you've got uh, the uh, you got all of them up in the in the in the new area. But um, Wolf's Ridge uh, is is probably one of the best new restaurants we've had in a while. Uh, go further, you got the City Tavern. Uh, you've got one that's very difficult to produce and dangerous called Hoofhearted. Um, the, you said it too quick. <laughs> the uh, uh, Coseco, uh, uh, Fox in the in the Snow. Soon, uh, Cameron will be bringing us yet another establishment, and it's an interesting um, kind of uh, concept because it's it, it's a food hall that will will be sort of a lab for new restaurants uh, at the Bud Dairy, which is that uh, brick and porcelain building that's yeah. up there. They'll have no, it's a. Unlike the short North Food Hall, which is sort of a fast food and bar thing, the Bud Dairy is a, a Cameron Mitchell. They're featuring nine different young entrepreneurs, and it's really a, a sort of a generator. There's a word for it. Income. In, incubator. Incubator for new, maybe people coming from food trucks to brick and mortar. It's sort of a step in between that allows them to develop their restaurant and then they can move on on their own. I think it's a very exciting yeah, concept. It's, it's a great laboratory. So, so if, if we stick downtown, uh, maybe not some, some things that didn't work out. Uh, so I live near Columbus Commons and uh, we've had several restaurants of late close. Um, I'm thinking uh, Salt and Pine and DeNovo and um, 
you know, chintz room. Uh, so, but there's tons of development there. So was it just uh, not time yet? What do you, you're a, you live there, don't you? I, I live, I'm what not do you think? telling everyone <laughs> no. where I live. But. I'm wondering if there wasn't enough density in that area mm -hmm. to drive, what do you think? Well, I, think there, I think there was probably enough density and I, don't, I can't understand it. Yeah. Uh, in that, I like other than uh, most of the, of the folks moving in are young, like Aaron, um, and that population uh, or demographic seems to like uh, fast casual better than anything else. And, uh, De, De Novo, which was a, a, a great looking place, but lot, lots of expensive decor, uh, wasn't fast casual. Uh, Salt and Pine, uh, Chris Crater's place, great concept, too big, uh, but also really, it was, there was no tablecloth, but it was still not fast casual and, and maybe too experimental. So I think those folks must be going up to fourth <laughs> to be getting dinner. Uh, perhaps because the rents are so high in that area, they have to go to Dirty Frank's to get a dinner. But the, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's unusual, and I think it's going to catch on eventually. Um, I, I sure hope so. We've got, we've got a new one. The GOAT has opened uh, recently. Mm -hmm. uh, good luck to that. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's a, a conundrum. I don't know. Yeah. I am concerned about this. The, uh, the, not concerned, but I, I think some of this is driven, I'm agreeing with Rich, with the millennials who sort of like fast casual. They want to go in, they want to choose exactly what they want a la Starbucks. They want it quick. If they sit, they want to sit on a, on a high top or something like that With and, their they're, and they're gone. <laughs> and so that seems to be driving some of the um, some of these other smaller sit downs, chilies and things like uh, uh, other fast, uh, fast sit down restaurants. And it has to be a walk around neighborhood. Yes. Uh, German Village, the short north, there's a lot of opportunity to get out and stroll, and there's not that, that much going on downtown in that area. I hope uh, you know, the area, particularly around uh, the commons, mm -hmm. uh, can develop that yeah. kind of walk around. Yeah. So, yes. Can I, I just want to add to that. I, I think beyond just the, the fast casual concept, I think what a lot of younger people are looking for is a different type of just overall experience. And so when you look at something like uh, what's going on on North 4th Street, a lot of it is brewery based. Yes. Uh, going to Seventh Sun, which is a bar and a brewery, they bring food trucks outside on the patio. And people like the idea of being able to pick between two or three different food trucks, dine outside, sit at communal picnic tables, make friends with new people. Pins. There's often music. P Pins is another great example. It's a bar, it's bowling. It's, it's, there's more to do there with your hands than just hold a beer and talk to someone. <laughs> you can play pinball, That's you can novel. bowl, you can play giant uh, Jenga out on the patio. They have beer pong. It's, it's, it's a different type of... Uh, Perfect for our demographic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like you're saying, you know, the, the food hall concept is very temporal. You go there one week versus another week, you might have a different experience. Uh -huh. And so it's just breaking out of the tradition of, you know, I'm going to go to a restaurant and I'm going to have consistency and the same thing every single time. And I think there is a time and a place for that. Obviously, we're not seeing every... White Castle. Yeah, we're not seeing every <laughs> um, dining establishment going away. But I think there is competitiveness for those dollars where, I mean, like you mentioned at Columbus Commons, Condado is doing gangbusters. It is. Because yeah. people can go in there four or five times a week and buy a $3 taco and a $4 margarita versus spending, you know, $100 at DeNovo on a, on a nice night out. Exactly. I think the price point is real yeah. important. Well, yeah. there's another emerging trend on the coast, particularly New York and Boston, called fine casual. It's as described by Danny Meyer, the famous New York restaurateur. And what those are, are chef-driven, really good food, almost always wine and beer, even in burger joints. An example would be um, Shake Shack that Danny Meyer is a part of, where they have gourmet hamburgers, but also beer and wine. And it, there's a new one called Eventide in Boston, where you have a James Beard award-winning chef doing what is largely a um, lobster roll place, fabulous lobster rolls, brown butter, homemade uh, buns, and gourmet soft serve and alcohol in high tops where people come in, choose exactly what they want, and then m generally move along quickly, which I think is a, a trend of the current time. It's, it's the current rendition of uh, legal seafood, essentially. Yeah. yeah. 
So I was hoping we could uh, move north a little bit and touch on uh, Northland, uh, which really suffered uh, after the mall closed in uh, 2002, I believe. Uh, Columbus Alive, give, give a shout out to Columbus Alive, uh, recently called the area along Morse Road the city's true entrepreneurial heart. Uh, I was wondering if one of you could, could take that, and uh, I know Momogar is probably a good example yeah. uh, of a place that really brought in people who otherwise might not go uh, visit that area. Yeah, well, I think, I think it is, uh, you know, essentially a, the, the blessing of a, of a more diverse population uh, that the space in that area obviously is going to be less expensive. People can take a chance and they can also offer, um, you know, a native cuisine, uh, which makes it, you know, so that's the Somali neighborhood, essentially. Right. Um, and uh, I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's great to have. Because we, uh, as Steve always reminds us, we, we only really had three kinds of restaurants 25 years ago. Um, we had... Gim Long, Yong Mei, and Prezzutis were the, <laughs> as the grumpy gourmet told us once. But to, to take on Rich's point, you see a lot of African restaurants. Kroger, Kroger on Morse Road has goat because of the African population. And that whole area is maybe because of rent. But it, somebody was just mentioning Bethel Road. We drove down Bethel Road uh, about a year ago and counted 42 ethnic restaurants and groceries between Olentangy River Road and Sawmill. Kamal, you, you've got a heartland of, of, of great dining opportunities near the refectory. And he, he may have been the catalyst for, the, for Bethel Road. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know he goes to the Mexican place on Go Down. <laughs> <laughs> Los Guachos is one of his favorites. Yeah. I, I think the really nice thing about those uh, spaces there is, is that they were intended to serve, you know, maybe their original kind of ethnic families and neighbors, you know, the food that they. Uh, that they know from the, the countries that they're from. But as a city, I think we've grown to appreciate and explore a little bit more, partly due to our local media exposing people to you know, new opportunities and different kinds of food, but great uh, entrepreneurial upstarts uh, like Bethia Wolf's um, Columbus Food Adventures, where she takes people on tours uh, in a van, you load up and you go try a Somali restaurant or an Ethiopian restaurant or uh, a restaurant from Nepal. Um, just kind of get you out of your comfort zone, but also in a way that you get to know the chefs, you get to know the owners, and kind of make that uh, community connection. Right. If you, ha if you haven't done the taco truck tour, right. it it's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of a get you out of your zip code kind of. Yes, our admonition is to get out of your culinary and geographical zip uh, comfort zone and try some of these other cool places. I think, uh, I harking back to what the Grumpy Gourmet said about the, the three uh, ethnic restaurants 40 years ago, think of the explosion in the last 40 years. Uh, all kinds of Filipino restaurants in Columbus, Tibetan, and uh, some Salvadorian, a Japanese, there's one from Bhutan. Bhutan. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, we should do a whole show on that yep. because it just has changed the face of Columbus, in part driven by people, but also driven by there. It's been largely driven by interesting and unusual food that people like to try. And we're lucky to have a community that, uh, with a lot of academic institutions, and I think um, students and the perform professorial staff likes to go out and try something new, so I, and that helps support it. A lot of those professors may also be immigrants. Uh, Walker, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, can, are restaurants sometimes a victim of their own success? So they help really build up a neighborhood, a community, uh, and before long it, it grows in popularity and they can't afford the rent anymore. Are we seeing examples of that? I, I think we've seen some examples. I think it's, it's typically a more complicated story than just not being able to afford the rent. Um, I think one specific uh, example uh, that could be worth talking about would be Haiku in the short north. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd been there, I believe, 20 years-ish. Yeah. Um, I believe the owner owned the building outright. Paul and Lou. yeah, Paul Liu and, and his family. Uh, and so they had an opportunity to sell to a developer. They've demolished the building and there's a new 10-story hotel, which will have a Cleveland-based restaurant going in the ground floor. Um, so I, I think when the news announced that Haiku was closing and, and it was going away, people were pretty upset because they had you know, fond memories of the place. It was a great place. At the same time, his family, you know, he, he's ready to retire with the money that he made in the process. So it's, it's a, I guess, a bittersweet situation. But 
Yeah, I mean, if, if a neighborhood kind of grows up around uh, a restaurant, it has to either adapt and change or, or something will have to change. Mm -hmm. Well, go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, I think it, 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 sometimes it's just the, um, the chef getting tired. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, uh, you can attribute Hanke's closure. It certainly wasn't less popular, even though that neighborhood went up and down a, a little bit. It's coming up again. But, um, you know, he was uh, 68 years old and, and sleeping four hours a night and uh, closing the restaurant at, at, at 11, staying up till 2, and then getting to Myers to go shopping at 7 o'clock in the morning, and that, that takes its toll. And I think that's also the, the case with Kihachi. Um, so yeah. they're just aging out of it. It's not like always the uh, a victim of their own success. It's just the, those, of, those of us who are getting more geriatric. And the whole generation, <laughs> Hanky and Chef Uber and, uh, and uh, Mike Kimura at Kihachi, all of them. But lest we forget the short north, when we're speaking about history and pioneers, Kent Rigsby, really went into a neighborhood, and Rich, you, you spent a lot yeah, of time that, there. That's a that's a, a really an interesting thing. When I was a kid, my, my dad uh, was a principal at a place called United Commercial Travelers, which is now the Pizzuti Gallery um, and on, on Park. And I, of course, was hired probably underage to do, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to do some work in the mailroom, et cetera. Uh, so I was there from uh, 16 to probably 19 years of age. And um, there was no place safe to eat. It was Skid Row. There were literally, you know, guys in uh, in doorways with uh, paper bags with, you know, MD 2020. Uh, the uh, the only place to eat, and it's remained in a in a different iteration, was Phillips Coney Island. It was the only really safe place. And then all of a sudden, Kent took took the chance with the Woods Brothers to open uh, Rigsby's and. It, uh, and, the, and the growth of the convention center and other things in that area uh, really, really took off. And now I think we call it, as we, we, we want to rename it because the guy that's principal, uh, principally responsible for, for opening way, way m number of restaurants is uh, Cameron. And so we call it, instead of Short North, we call it Short Cam these days. <laughs> and there's more to come from Cameron in that area because he's got uh, 711 North High Street <clears throat> pardon me, the new build on the west side of the street, there's going to be a Cameron Mitchell concept on the first floor and possibly another Cameron Mitchell concept with a rooftop bar. That's probably the hottest trend in Columbus restaurants today. Mm -hmm. There will be a dozen by this summer, but a rooftop bar at 711 North High Street. I think he's up to some other kind of mischief in the short north. Oh, Ed and Harvey's. The replacement, uh, to, the, to which is in the Rigsby's location, is going to be a deli in the mold of Russ and Daughters in New York City. So uh, you've got Martini, Marcella's, Guildhouse, The Pearl, and as we, Rich calls it, the Cameron Mitchell Short North. Yeah. So continuing to look forward, what other uh, neighborhoods or restaurants should we keep an eye on? Coming I'm anxious to see something. Uh, it's beginning to to uh, heat up a little bit with, uh, for instance, the opening of the new brew dog, Franklinton. It'd be really great for Franklinton to, to, to have that uh, chicken and egg nourishing the neighborhood kind of uh, get land grants at uh, uh, the, the brew dog, which is a great place if you haven't been there yet. It uh, has a rooftop bar. It has a rooftop bar as well. <clears throat> What's the one which has a big, uh, they have a lot of weddings, our niece. Juniper? No, that's strong water. Strong water. Strong water. It's yep. got a nice restaurant and a, a space for weddings and receptions. You can also see red, white, and boom from many areas in Franklinton. So there, it seems like. And the spaghetti warehouse is still open. And correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong. It seems like there, the restaurants are driving the change in the colonization. What do you think? I, I think so too, and I, I was going to mention, you know, in addition on the uh, the rooftop bar trend, it's it's gone outside of just downtown. We were at Vaso this past weekend, which was the rooftop bar uh, at the AC Hotel in Dublin at Bridge Park, the new development there. Um, a vast mixed-use project if you haven't been uh, kind of to the core of Dublin in a while, but a lot of that is driven through <laughs> restaurants, and I, I think they've taken the approach of um, gathering a lot of sort of best-in-class. Uh, operators from around the city. There's a couple of Cameron Mitchell uh, locations there. Mm -hmm. Local Cantina, 16-bit is opening. Pins is already there. Um, they're, they're kind of bringing. Z Kachina mm -hmm. and uh, the one, uh, the 
Irish pub Fado. out of the east at Fado are going to yeah. be up there. Um, we, we just, by the way, sh shameless self-promotion, -promo uh, we've reviewed Vaso and uh, Juniper on WOSU.org slash Chefs in the City. Rich has long hosted a, week, a monthly show at Fridays at 11. I'm lucky enough to be a guest. And um, we have about a, a lot of reviews, including those new places. I, I'd also uh, like to, it, it, it got a foothold and it needs a little bit more of a push. I think uh, Old Town East is a neighborhood that, uh, you know, with uh, Yellow Brick Pizza, the, the tavern, Yellow Brick, I think, just took over in another location. Um, the, it's unfortunate <laughs> that we, uh, that some of uh, the highway development uh, shut down Black Creek. You couldn't get there yeah. on Parsons. But, uh, but part of that is that there's a streetscape construction project going on on Parsons yeah. itself, which has taken a lot longer, I think, than originally anticipated. But it also, there, there's buzz around what's going to replace them in that spot, which is oh, pretty, good. pretty critical. I live on the Near East Side myself, and so that's, that's a topic a lot with uh, oncoming development on Long Street. As that comes along, what types of restaurants are going to come in there? And then to kind of go back to what you were saying about restaurants being the victim of their own success, I, I think the, the other way to turn that question around is can, can neighborhoods become a victim of the success of what gets built up around there? You know, if you're talking, Rich, about uh, the short north being a place 30 years ago, it was hard to find a safe place to eat. Now it's turned into a place where it's tougher and tougher to find an affordable place to eat. Or a parking space. Or, <laughs> or an affordable place to live or an affordable anything. So, you know, is the idea of economic success one that everything is very high end or is it something that serves the broader population? Can anyone go there and find something they're looking for? Good point. Well, yeah. that Dublin development, the Bridge Park is in a, is, has a couple of important issues. Number one, the population drove that because this is huge development at Riverside and 161, but it also goes across the river. There's another Bridge Park over there with um, with the Avenue Steak Tavern and, and some other things that are popping up on the west side of the river. And that may be driven by the population and the need for restaurants in that area as well. And I should say we are, in a few minutes, we're gonna do Q&A. Uh, so in about five minutes, please step up to the microphone. Where's the microphone? It's gonna be over there. Um, don't be shy. That's in about five minutes. Okay. Uh, so I feel like we, we need to mention, uh, when I talk to restaurant owners, uh, a lot of them tell me one of their biggest challenges is finding qualified talent turnover. Um, so we should mention Cameron Mitchell's uh, donation to uh, Columbus State's Culinary Arts Program. Oh, it's going to be a beautiful building. In, in right. Um, so what does that mean for the restaurant scene um, and, and our economic growth? I think it means a great deal. We've got to have people to produce, you know, good food, uh, and it, they're doing a, a wonderful job uh, of cranking out students. Uh, Cameron often gets them after their first year in that program, uh, and it's, uh, you know, you can learn, you can learn good uh, skills uh, by uh, by being in a kitchen as well uh, at a restaurant. But I think I think. Uh, uh, that and, and the attention to a training of service uh, is is critical. And with 66 new restaurants, did somebody tell me, like Columbus Underground, if you don't read it regularly, you should. Um, 66 new restaurants in, in 2017. Um, and even in 90 the year before that. So, um, and, and that doesn't count every, you know, like there were probably 10 Chipotles that opened <laughs> right. during that year, right. and five more McDonald's and all of that. Yep. It's, it's just primarily local. Yep. Yeah. Like the Dine Originals group, which is a terrific uh, group of uh, local chefs, really. And most chef and chef owner, or restaurant owners, I think there are 55 uh, in that group, and they have a they have a, a, a chef's or a Dine Originals week every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, they also had just a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, their uh, annual uh, show where all the vendors get together. Uh, the other thing that, that has brought attention to uh, the Columbus State program is uh, Taste of the Future. Uh, which will be held August 14th, uh, well worth the $125. You get a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, graduates from the from the school, uh, but a lot of other local restaurant tours setting up booths. There are uh, also um, beverages. We haven't talked about what distilleries have done <laughs> to the neighborhood, which is mostly positive, but. Um, 
It's all good. Let's Rich see. mentioned distilleries. They're sort of driving the train in a couple. Uh, Walker talked about brew pubs and breweries that are having restaurants, but two restaurants, the service bar at Middle West Spirits and Watershed have restaurants and distilleries that are excellent, chef-driven, uh, could be in anybody's top 10 uh, uh, kind of restaurants, which is a really cool thing. And the menus are interestingly de designed to be friendly to cocktails as much as wine and beer. So as any good journalist would ask, is there anything I forgot to ask? Well, I've got one thing. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I, we, we talked about all these other things, but some of the other two more drivers I thought of today, this morning in the shower, is that <laughs> about 30 years ago, one third of our food dollars went to restaurants and two thirds went to dining at home. People cooked Sunday dinner. That's flipped now, and more than two-thirds of the food dollar now goes to dining out and carry out. I think that a and lot of what Walker said and Ritz said is bringing people there. That, that, and I don't know where the, uh, the blue apron, order it at home, uh, fits into all of that. I, I, can't, I, don't, I guess that's cooking for yourself, but it's kind of on the, on the, on the line. In fact, that's uh, been... Uh, the, the cause they, they claim for a lot of other big cities uh, losing restaurants because yeah. people are more anxious to, uh, to do a little cooking at home, uh, which we like to encourage because of cooking classes. But <laughs> And one more thing, the importance of grocery shopping. You know, there are some areas of town that they really don't have. Downtown doesn't have a grocery store other than the Crozier in the uh, brewery district. And, and, and the Hills the Market. Store. Yeah. Oh, yes. That, and, and the North Market. And dining in. <laughs> And uh, so, and hills. <laughs> chicken and egg, do we need more grocery shopping? I know that on the East Coast, Whole Foods has these mini stores about the size of a CVS that, have, that are pretty much full service groceries, so they may have packaged meats. And that may be a driver of the future, and how does that affect uh, restaurants? And a topic for something. another day is what is Amazon going to do to the grocery stores? Uh, because uh, the grocery stores will probably get smaller, and you'll get the fresh produce and the and the, uh, the meat counter and the cheeses, etc. But everything in the middle, you're going to order from Amazon to have it delivered to your door. So you'll see the smaller grocery stores. Okay, it looks like we have people lined up. It is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name and ask your question. In fairness to all, we'd like to get as many questions as possible, so uh, please avoid editorial comments. Let's get started. First question. Hi, Aaron Pitcock. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I live in German Village, and we recently lost the original Max and Irma's location. Uh, so despite the fact that Max and Irma's had grown into a large chain, it was a great local spot, and um, that space has been vacant. Seems to be a great space. Wonder if you've heard of what might go in there, and maybe why it sat vacant for so long. So. I, I haven't heard anything about what what's going to replace it. Um, I don't know the specifics about who owns the building and what they're looking for in rent or what they're looking to do. It's, oh, right. go ahead. Go ahead. It's 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 a perfect target for for either the Al Shahal brothers who own the Crest, Crest. and, and uh, a number of others, or Chris Crater with uh, oh. stuff nearby with uh, the, the Sycamore and Curia Harvest and Pizza. Harvest Pizza. Uh, my guess is, and I hope it would be one of those guys because they do a great job. Yeah. If it, I knew, I wouldn't say because Walker's right there. <laughs> get, get the scoop. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not too uncommon to see something sit for a while, usually because of other factors. Less about demand, because obviously there's, there's uh, personal income to be spent in German Village on a local place. So there's, there's probably something else at play, I would imagine. Okay, next question. My name is Jan Lidden. My husband and I like to eat out periodically and find the array of restaurants in Columbus quite intriguing. The problem is it seems like many of them are so noisy that, is that a trend? Uh, 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 we've talked with Cameron, actually, I think it was at one of these forums a couple of years ago, and uh, I was commenting that maybe it was the Pearl that had opened, and, it was, and the food was good, et cetera, but you couldn't hear each other. Uh, and, he, and he admitted that that's 
at least for the millennial generation, on purpose. If the millennials walk into a quiet restaurant, they think that something's wrong. <laughs> and it must not be any good. So they crank up the, the noise level, and that's the reason there are hard surfaces in a lot of those. Um, it, it's, it, the, the guild house is quieted down. The refectory is nice and quiet. <laughs> well, the reason for that, I, uh, well, what, an interesting twist to that is uh, we were speaking at the uh, Scioto Country Club, I think the uh, Arlington Rotary, and we, somebody asked that question. And one guy got up and posited, well, you know, Cameron's getting up there in years now, and he doesn't like it so noisy. So some of the recent restaurants, the Guild House, as Rich pointed out, and the Avenue Steak Tavern are much quieter, and they actually have much lower wine prices. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's worth pointing out too, a lot of the newer places that we've been talking about in downtown Short North um, are going into large old existing spaces. Wolf's Ridge, for example, is kind of a warehouse type environment. So when you combine hardwood floors, brick walls, high ceilings, you're kind of creating this acoustical nightmare where there's no, so unless they're hanging some sort of fabric from the ceiling or have some sort of acoustical treatment like this, you're, you're basically in a an echo chamber box, so it's, it's destined to be loud. I just spoke with Rick Lopez, who owns uh, the uh, La Tabula in Grandview and has just opened a very nice place called Lupo on the Upper Arlington Mallway. And it's, a, it's a basically Spanish and Italian tapas. But it, the din in there was very, very loud. And the first thing he said when I called to tell him what I thought about the restaurant was, we're working on the sound because that is an issue. And you can uh, dine outside, too. So. <laughs> Great uh, next, next question. Hi, my name is Trevor <laughs> Thomas. I'm here from S4 Consulting. I just read this article recently about the emergence of supper clubs in Columbus, including one at Land Grant that's held every month. I was wondering if you could, you could talk a little bit about the influence of that on the Columbus food scene. The influence of supper clubs. Yeah. Uh, Have you been not to yet. The, the one at Land Grant? Uh, it's hosted by Ray Ray's. That's the I haven't been, so yeah. I can't comment. Well, I, I will say, uh, especially beer dinners are a big trend we're seeing. Wine I know beer. Rock Mill uh, has, a beer, has a beer dinner, maybe monthly. Um, so that's definitely a, bit, a big trend. But I don't think supper clubs are here yet. You'll see them in San Francisco and a couple of other places I've read about, but that could be an emerging trend for 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with kind of the experience that people are looking for, because you can go out to any restaurant any day of the week, but if you can go out to some sort of one night only, you kind of tap into that uh, millennial sense of FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you don't go to that supper club, you could have missed the coolest thing all year, so. There was one that was around briefly where we had a different chef every month. Um, and they had, uh, I remember I attended one on Goodale, and it was that kind of experience. It was, it, it's it was, Curio, uh, not, uh, not Curio, down on South High Street. Copious. 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 Uh, they, they're doing some dining with uh, It's because they have uh, shows. Yeah, because they've got, uh, it was, Copious was opened in part by a, a bunch of folks from uh, Jazz Arts Group, and they have uh, jazz, great, great programs, by the way, uh, downstairs, uh, and they have a large room upstairs for, for weddings and that kind of thing. And so they're doing theme, thematic things every once in a while geared mm -hmm. to the shows. To, to follow up to that question, I will say, I think some of these dinners uh, give chefs an opportunity to really stretch their legs outside of maybe their normal uh, menu, and so it can be a really fun experience to, to go, uh, you know, see, and them, lest, see them do different things. Unless we forget the refectory has opera, jazz, and a bunch of other uh, music series uh, that, that go along with fine dining there. You can have a meal and watch a concert in the upstairs room. Also, wine dinners uh, are very popular. I think the number was 100 last year. Was it? <laughs> wow. Is Refectory in the house? Is that one of them? <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Amanda Sage and I'm with the Metropolitan Club. I was born, raised, and still live in the northeast suburbs. So basically New Albany, Westerville has always been my stomping ground. And you see some really great restaurants pop up, especially in Old Town Westerville, like Uptown Deli and Brew and Asterix and things like that. But especially in New Albany and in definitely parts of Uptown, you see a lot of failures. What is it about the suburban, suburban neighborhoods and the suburban restaurants that just aren't pulling the people in and then staying afloat? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, 
since I'm from Upper Arlington, we, we say, oh, those people in New Albany <laughs> and Westerville. Uptown Westerville's come and gone. New Albany's had a, remember, Kent Rigsby had a really nice restaurant there. And there were a lot of complaints that I got for, because they had a $19 pasta, for God's sake. <laughs> so, and there's, a, there's some new ones opening now in New Albany. It, it does seem to be snake bit <clears throat> a little bit. Um, and maybe folks, uh, maybe the, the, the investors um, <laughs> are not anxious to help people open a new one. But uh, they'll, get, they'll get over it as things sneak out from, particularly from the Easton area. Uh, so, yeah. I, I think your question really ties into the overall question of what this forum is about, which is do restaurants nourish neighborhood revitalization? And I think the, the, you know, I think they play a role. I don't think it's a, you know, it's not a, uh, like a silver bullet if you're looking to, to change a neighborhood. But does the restaurant exist to serve an existing population? Does someone open something in New Albany to serve the people who are already there? Or is it opening to be a destination and they're trying to attract people from somewhere else? And I think if, if there's not a clear goal or definition as to what that restaurant is, it may succeed or fail based on that. I think we've seen restaurants like um, Dirty Frank's open on the west side on Westgate, which is kind of a restaurant desert uh, to some degree. Um, they weren't quite able to make it work. Their downtown location is still doing really well. And I think part of that has to do with people's willingness to see downtown as a destination. Uh, there's other places you can go. Even if you go to Dirty Frank's and there's a 45 minute wait downtown, there's other things you can walk Around to next door. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but on West Broad, you're probably not walking up and down the street going anywhere else, <laughs> even if there were other places to go. So it's, you know, you, you have to kind of fit into one category or the other, and may, maybe that plays into some of those suburban locations too. And I think a lot of the, the, the restaurants like Rigsby's um, and even uh, Spaggio's, when they moved in, the rent was cheap. Uh, and I don't know if there's a lot of less expensive spaces uh, in those uh, new development projects. Yes. Next question. Hi, hi folks. Uh, David Shasbro, President Emeritus of COSI. Um, I'm going to flip from the millennials to the other side of the equation, which I'm a little closer to. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you may have some sense of the demographics, but I'm wondering how much happy hours and, you know, my age of, of baby boomer doesn't want to even hear about uh, early bird special like our grandparents went to. But we sure as hell look for the best happy hours around, yes. which essentially gives you the same thing, but with a little bit of uh, enjoyment and, and uh, alcohol with it. And I'm wondering, with the mix downtown, because I know, and the reason I was thinking about this, Rick Ziliak, uh, who has Z, Z Cucina, right. um, he was saying that a really good happy hour helps to kind of jump start the business for the night because you, you know, someone walks by, they have other options, and they see people at, you know, in the restaurant. And I'm just wondering how much the happy hours play into this phenomenon, and if, if there are enough of my age that actually makes um, a contributing factor versus just, it seems like it, all the talk's been about millennials, and I'd like not to give up on the, you know, on the baby boomers yet, because we're still going out. <laughs> well, you've come we to the right place. <laughs> we, actually, Steve and Mary and Roberta and I, and another couple, uh, have, have Tom and Janie O'Shaughnessy have been doing this for, for a while. Uh, been going to happy hours. We, it's the replacement of, of uh, the blue hair special. Not early bird specials. <laughs> Not early bird specials. Blue they're hair. they're usually you know four to six or four to. Uh, seven and uh, there's some really great ones around. I think that may be true of, of a new place uh, in, the, in the village uh, called the South Village Grill, which has a terrific uh, happy hour. And if you get there too late, and you just order one cocktail and you're still hungry, that helps business. Yep. Um, uh, Lindy's has, has a great one. I've been encouraging the people at the uh, keep to have a happy hour. They, they need to, to keep the business downtown. They've got uh, good folks coming in after work, but they don't have a happy hour to entice them to stay around. G. Michaels has a good one. Anyway, you'll see a story on WSU. We've been to 15 now. It's been grueling. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody has to do it. Yeah. I, I just want to clarify that I'm an exennial. <laughs> which is kind of a 50-50 Gen X millennial. If you're born between the first Star Wars and the third Star Wars movie, you fit, <laughs> you fit that sliver of a demographic. I, I think it's really interesting, though, that uh, at the end of the day, generally speaking, with like consumer trends, millennials and baby boomers want a lot of the same things. There's a lot of talk in the housing market about what they want, and it's walkable neighborhoods, it's amenities nearby, it's a, it's a you know, place to go uh, that's you know, more of an experience. 
Um, so, I, you know, I, I think a lot of restaurants can appeal to both demographics really easily. Good question. Irina, I'm on the Columbus Humane Board, and thank you all for being here today. I did want to ask about the um, local source trend. You talked a little bit about the way our restaurant trends are impacting neighborhoods and groceries, but at the beginning of the process is where do our restaurants get their food, and how is this restaurant boom impacting that aspect of our economy and neighborhoods? Well, it's evolved. Kent Rigsby is known because back in the day he had 32 different vendors that he went to to get the best and brightest. And now it's evolved to local sourcing. We get our strawberries from Rhodes Farm Market in Circleville or this, that, and the other thing. And now a lot of restaurants and clubs have gardens. For example, the Crest Gastro Pub has gardens outside and around, uh, bread and flowers in Clintonville has a gardens, and so people are not only getting local sourcing. They're growing the, it themselves. They're growing it themselves. <laughs> the North Star people. Uh, uh, They've been uh, great at it. Yeah, Kevin Mullaney once told me that he got a different pork producer for uh, one of his restaurants. It wasn't the exact right. Uh, her third in Hollywood got a different pork producer than the North Stars because he liked the uh, mix there with his restaurants. <clears throat> I'm Fred Looper. Uh, the, we've missed one uh, trend. You've talked about lots of new trends. The one I'm talking about is the top. Oh. Now, uh, top that was last decorated in 1948. <laughs> <laughs> they don't turn the lights on until about <laughs> 10 o'clock at night. Uh, they charge very high prices, and you can't get in the door. And so, thank goodness Sonia Modes is still playing occasionally. And, and, and when she's, well, never mind. Uh, why is that? Uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's been a neighborhood, I grew up on the east side in Bexley, and it's been a neighborhood uh, uh, place for years. Uh, it's a club almost, um, and there are a lot of repeat offenders at the bar all the time. Um, they, uh, although we've got some good friends, the Gutenkoffs go there every, every week from Arlington. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's the, it's the 1950s, Connie Stevens should be up singing kind of place. Uh, and they've got great steaks, good, mashed, good baked potatoes, a good salad at, at high prices. And Windward Passage in the Northwest area is another popular place, really, really good. Lake Perch and Lake Walleye in a, a very dark environment with saucy waitresses and uh, it, it, but it has a loyal, loyal following. You expect to see the people at the bar with cigarettes and a cocktail. Jane so Scott. I, I, think the, I think the top's going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jane Scott with the Metropolitan Club. Uh, we haven't talked at all about tourism and how that influences the local restaurants and development, but um, you all, we know, uh, are doing the happy hours, but we have a group which some of you are involved in. We're doing the, bo the bars at the hotels this year because some of the best bars in the city are at the hotel, and we don't stay in the hotels, so we miss out on some of the best bars. So if anybody wants to join us at the Hilton uh, this Friday, come on this down. This is another benefit of membership. This is another benefit of membership. <laughs> but talk a little bit about how the restaurants draw tourism. Tourism helps the restaurants and, and that connection before we end. I think Experience Columbus would probably say it's critical for, uh, particularly in the neighborhood of the convention center, and, they, and they're served well by the short north. Yeah, I mean, there's that immediate uh, need. A, a place like the North Market uh, almost serves as an extension of, uh, of visitors. You know, if they're coming into town and staying at a hotel by the convention center or coming to a convention, that's kind of their entry point. And the North Market, I think, over the past couple of years, disclaimer, I was on the board for six years, um, has positioned itself as kind of being that best in class kind of showcase. They want to give people who are new to town an opportunity to see what Columbus is all about and then hopefully get them to learn about what they can go out and experience while they're here in other neighborhoods. And having a lively area like the Short North immediately adjacent to the convention center I think is a huge, huge, huge plus as we found out with the NCAA women's basketball tournament and other recent events. Hockey. Yeah. And Jane's uh, hotel, uh, restaurant, bar, 
ex exploration is really a lot of fun. I'd encourage you to join us. It's a tremendous amount of research. <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful, like you That's guys critical. say. Yeah. yeah, like you guys say, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, smoke and mirrors, right, from one microphone to the other. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's forum and found it as informative and as tantalizing as I did. We encourage you to continue the conversation and talk with our panelists more the back of the room with our traditional coffee and cookies here at the Boathouse. And would you help me thank our sponsor, the Dispatch Media Group. Thank you very much. And of course, let's thank our speakers, Steve Stover, Rich Terpak, Walker Evans, and Aaron G. Edwards. Thank you all, what fun. And thanks to all of you. We look forward to seeing you at CMC again soon. Mm -hmm.